This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, thanks to all three speakers for a really rich array of papers that show us some of the concerns of researchers at the moment. And I think we've had a really, we've been taken on a journey, if you like, from the more traditional literary form of the novels of Fuentes and Gutierrez through to um, literary reinventions and intertexts in digital form to, um, to the, the graphic fictions that Ed was talking about, and that really um, a fundamental reminder in that quote that you um, uh, used from uh, Mitchell, that all media are, are mixed. I think that's very, been very much a theme of, of this panel. And I know that there'll be um, loads of questions that will try and fit into just the 10, 10 perhaps even 15 minutes we might have if we encroach into a bit of lunchtime, um, because they've raised so many interesting questions. Um, so I'm going to throw it open to the floor. Um, yes. I hope that the film was really excellent, very illuminating for the kind of picture that is arising now in Latin America. If you could speak up just a bit, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm very, uh, well, it was a fascinating panel, and very uh, kind of illustrative of what is happening in Latin America, what kind of fiction. We, uh, talking about uh, some of the works in the library, are trying to uh, capture and uh, archive and preserve. And I have a question for Claire. It's about, uh, are you involved in any kind of project of uh, capturing these uh, works that mm. we're talking about? Because if you talk about them now, mm. in the future, that's going to be completely irrelevant if you talk about something that doesn't exist yes. anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a major issue. There's al already things that I've published and that I'm still, in fact, writing on and they've disappeared and I'm trying to contact the author to say, please send me a copy. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a live issue and it's also a live issue with teaching for those of us who are teachers because I do teach in final year to my, my students and, again, things, things are ephemeral. Um, the websites disappear. A few years ago, I did put in an application to the British Academy for um, a small pot of funding for precisely that, for web capture. It wasn't successful. But it's a longer term, it's a certain longer term aim of mine and I know that the British Library does have does have a web archiving system yeah. well, we um, do archive only uh, well, UK websites ah, okay, so that's, yeah um, so yeah, it's a lot because one of the ways that you can capture just the number of basics is through the Wayback Machine, but it only captures the front page and a lot of the works I'm talking about, you actually need to go in and activate them for them to actually become works of literature. Um, so it's not, that's not sufficient. So it, it is a major issue. Um, perhaps you and I can have a chat over lunch about some more of the, you know, some opportunities for that, but um, longer term aim, definitely. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> and also a question about how how this this um, text um, challenge also national boundaries yeah. as mm. well and, 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 and mm. national literature and if there is mm. something of national literature there yes. as well and yeah, it's yeah. a mm -hmm. completely yeah. different criteria that we yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, first of all, in translation, um, I think not coincidentally, a significant number of the authors who publish online tend to have more than one interface to their work, so they will actually have um, an English language interface. Um, so a case in point might be Marina Cerberini from Argentina, um, her Tejido Memoria, you can access it in English and in Spanish, but then once you get into the level of the content, it's all in Spanish, so there is a certain amount of translation already available, English language translation. Um, I think co commercial translation, I think, is going to be very unlikely for these sorts of works, I would, I would imagine. But perhaps the translation project that we heard about earlier might be interested in, in some of these works. Um, regarding national boundaries, I think, well, yes and no. I think that it certainly is the case that a lot of, a lot of the writers are working in, in transnational frameworks. So Melengache, for example, her work is very heavily influenced by the surrealists and by French surrealism as much as it is by uh, her Argentinian um, sort of predecessors. Um, but having said that, that's not the same as her work being completely um, free-floating and, and completely 
having no relationship to national context. I think in the case of all authors, I think even authors who work in print text will always be dialoguing with international movements and will have influences that come from other parts of the globe. Um, but for me, what I find the most interesting about these sorts of works online is how they often use globalised medium to actually talk about very specific local concerns. Um, so some of the examples I showed you there were kind of deliberately um, approachable and sort of non, you know, non, non sort of specific to a very, very particular case in point of a country. But something that I'm very interested in is, is how grassroots movements and grassroots issues are then worked through online. And um, picking up on that point, but also um, a question for you, Claire, but perhaps also for Ed too, um, uh, which goes back to some of the concerns we had in, that emerged from the first panel, um, which were about sort of ca the canon and mm. revising the canon. Um, to what extent is the sort of democrati the democratizing form of the web or the comic um, or graphic form um, reflected in authorship? Um, I'm thinking, um, you know. You, uh, could you give us a, are there protagonists in, in these fields um, who, uh, do, do you think, do you think the forms are democratising authorship as well? Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Mm -hmm. Do you want to ask that first? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, I mean, it's interesting how the, the very form of the kind of, is a, is a assemblage, it's a collective mm -hmm. process. And especially so in the kind of industrial forms I talked about at the end, the, Mauricio the souls of production, so he signs his name to it, but he's got like a massive, huge team of revolving artists um, that learn the house style and then develop it in different ways. And it's very difficult to, to identify in the kind of authorship and the whole thing. Um, and you create, but then on the, other, on the other side, you have this tendency, especially with the web, to almost reinforce the sense of authorship by allowing readers to have this constant um, connection to the process of, of creation itself. So um, two of the most famous um, comic artists outside of Brazil, um, Fabio Moon and Gabriel Bar, they, on their Facebook um, pages, for example, so that every day they have new examples that they give to their, to their fans of sketches of their work, um, as if sort of revealing the process of creation um, mm -hmm. in a way that reinforces a sense of authorship which is slightly unexpected, mm -hmm. considering what you've just been saying. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's also a tendency in uh, publishing as well to, to publish at the end of uh, a comic book the sketches that went into the sort of pre-sketches. Um, and in, in a way, again, that sort of reinforces this in the idea. So yeah, there are two different tendencies, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, in terms, of, in terms of what's happening in, in online literature, there are some initiatives that so um, Jaime Alejandro Rodriguez, who's, who's from Colombia, um, he's published his own, two of his own hypertext novels, but he also runs Narcopedia, which is like an online um, site for people to um, go in and create online fictions. And then there's also Domenico Chap in Venezuela. Again, he's published his own hypertext novels, but has also um, it's relatively recently set up a novela colectiva. So there are some there are some initiatives where they're attempting to get authorship to be actually um, collective um, and collaboratory right from the start. I think the problem is then getting people engaged and getting those people who have the time and the energy and the you know the capacity to to actually go in and, and create those works. I have to say, certainly with, with Jaime Alejandro's case, it does tend to be his students who for his, you know, for his classes in the Haveriana who have to go in and do it for their, for their, for their um, studies, um, who tend to be the ones who contribute to his works. So I think, yeah, there, there is, there's certainly potentials, but it depends on how far you want to take it as well, because obviously blogs, you know, potentially anybody can author a blog. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's also cultural capital and digital literacy, which are issues. So it's Absolutely. not, you know, yeah. particularly yeah. certain, you know, certain, the rural communities in Latin America tend to be underrepresented, yeah. tend to have problems with in infrastructure and access. Yeah. So it's, yeah. again, there are some major issues there. Thank you. Do 
going to start with? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, the use of the, the woodblock printing and that, it's become almost a, a sort of visual cliche in recent graphic fiction in Brazil as a kind of visual shorthand <laughs> representing the Northeast. But there was another collection of, called Historia Gerais that talked about tales of Kangasu in the Setao, and, um, and that also used a similar form. Um, so it's, it's almost a way of, of just um, of drawing attention to, to yeah, using a, a, a shorthand for, for referring to, to um, those practices, those popular practices. But also what was interesting about that was that, I mean, the, these so-called popular practices like woodblock printing were also attempts to use the contemporary technology of the day. Um, you know, using for distribution, using the, the railways and printing, um, and so what they what this book isn't doing is is a is nostalgically evoking a kind of national past that is drawing out it, but it's it's referring to that, that past as a kind of network of technologies, just like the present, if you, if you sort of mean. So it's not a kind of nostalgic thing of of trying to re-evoke some kind of national culture. It's problematizing that idea instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in the case of some of the works that I've looked at online, it, it, it's less a kind of teleological sense of this is what the surrealists could have done had they had the technology we've got today, and look, we can do it. I think it's more people dialoguing back and, and, and <coughs> showing the, the sort of the, the, the heritage that, that's there and the fact that online technologies um, aren't the first to think about things like hyperlinking, for example. Um, there, was, there, was a, there was a project which unfortunately isn't, has been taken down, but there was a few years ago somebody put up the Rayuelomatic, so it was Rayuela in the format as if you, you, know, you could just go to each one, each, each individual chapter as Cortasso had originally wanted it because of, obviously he was restricted by the printed page. Um, and then there's Ana Maria Uribe's Annie Poemas, where her, her um, as, well, because they're calligrams, really, but her, her, her visual poetry has then actually been animated. So there's, there's lots of examples where, where people have taken literary experimentation that was restricted of its, by its nature to the, what the printed page could do and then also shown as what, what you can then do when you add the digital uh, technologies to that. But again, I don't think it's this... People don't seem to have this theological sense that now we've reached the end point, you know, and this is... I think it's more a, a sense of dialogue and a sense of acknowledging what you know what, what ex literary experimentators did in the past. So there was a question at the back. Hi, I'm Maria. Um, I was really interested in what you're saying about these kind of private spaces of resistance that they've existed in Havana. Um, and I was wondering that if now the dialogue about homosexuality has been almost made public, do these private spaces still exist? And if so, do they function in the same way? They do. They do. Um, yeah, although in the official side they, they are quite open and much things have been done and um, and there's not such a persecution and it's happened in the past. Still, Cubans don't trust the system. And it happens to them even when they are in exile. They don't trust you. They don't trust. Sometimes it happens to me all the time when they, I approach them, some friends or some people who may give me good testimonies. They like to talk to me in the streets while walking. So it happened to me in New York, and I was really tired, and I had to <coughs> walk for two hours making a kind of interviews. And then I realized that he didn't want to go into a cafe with me, the, the writer I was talking to, because he didn't want me to record his words. So that's why we kept on, talk, on walking and walking and walking. And and, I, you know, they don't trust. They've got this sense of paranoia, and it comes with them even when they are in exile. And it happens in many other countries in Latin America when you go through a trauma or do you don't trust them. Um, but, yeah, they, they still they um, conceive this idea of the flat or the house like the Reda. For instance, I, um, when contacting some people, some writer in Madrid, he didn't want to give me his address. He didn't want to, uh, it took me half a year to make him, you know, meet him or to, to meet him in Madrid and then, and then when he took me to his flat, I realized, again, there was another worry there, all full up with the, 
um, you know, pictures, um, books, letters, manuscripts, things like that. So this is the art world. And there, within this private sphere, a true conversation happens. They open up their mind and they talk to you. So again, you can see that this private sphere versus public thing, which also connects with the idea of pretending. They pretend to be normal outside and they're well, normal. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask a similar question to Melanie about, about just the way in which you set up homosexuality and kind of being around in the division. I wonder whether you've sort of thought against the grain of the argument about homosexuality as being in this age of like reference. One of the things that Brandet picks up on is actually that there's an uncomfortable proximity between revolutionary ma masculinity in the early works and a particular kind of Cuban articulation of, of homosexuality. Yeah, it is a Cuban. Is that, so in a sense, it's not so neatly, it's just a discourse of resistance, but one of those sort of dialogue and uh, uncomfortable uh, proximity. Especially in the case of Bahamas, yeah. you know, who's supposed to be hungry for the real matter when he goes, goes to Miami. And it's sort of incorporated this sort of revolutionary discourse of masculinity. It works as destabilizing force outside, but not inside. Mm -hmm. I just wonder whether you might, whether you could expand that to think about something like they were wanting to get it, it's not. So, so, so I didn't understand your question. I, I threw the whole. Just whether you could destabilize the notion of it being always a destabilizing. They. <laughs> They act in these books as a stabilizing thing. Actually, going back to Arenas, for instance, he uses this idea of the militaries having sex among them in order to tell the system of the Fidel or who he talked to, you don't do that to make us invisible or to ignore us because you've got homosexuals within your troops. So they use this, the sex and the homosexual thing in order to challenge the system all the time and the, the, the ethos of the revolution, you see? That's how they do. But I agree with you, this idea of virility uh, related to the Cuban male is, um, is very, very important during the 20th century with all these um, battles inside the island trying to, um, to expel the Americans and the Spanish people. The Cuban macho, the new man, to be a virile man, a pure macho, a man. Um, so they play around with this idea all the time, yes, I agree, yeah. But they use it, they use sex and homosexuality in order to challenge and try to destabilize the whole ethos, you see? This sense of controlling what you think or what you, how you have to conduct yourself in public. And here we link again with the idea of public and private as well, you see? Whether they get it, whether they do it or not, that's another question. It very much depends on who you talk to, you say? Is it the same with female, female, non-straight relations? It could be, yeah. Well, they are more and more, um, they are much more invisible than males, you say? They're much more invisible than hum that male homosexuals. With lesbians, you mean? You refer to lesbians, yeah? It's a, um, it's a big thing here. It's still, they, they, didn't, they didn't show up. But if you go into the international, you know, it happens all the time in, in, in many other countries. The lesbians still, they are not so visible as male homosexuals. Oh yes, they live very much, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, could be, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I mean, the, um, it very much depends on who you talk to and what, uh, your perspective on that, you see. Um, whether you are in, within Cuba, you will see things completely differently and they will tell you completely different. They, they, they will deny this is the stabilizing thing, you see. But in exile, we as scholars who are dealing with it without you know, reading through it, we can see this is a challenge to the system. Whether they get it, whether they do it, no. Whether they destabilize the ethos, we don't know. The thing is that in 2010 or 11, even 11, um, Fidel Castro had to talk about this all the time, you know, because um, they asked him to do. Um, so he couldn't avoid talking about that anymore.
Thank you. I, I was going to say one of the things that connects the three papers was the, this notion of porosity. Um, uh, 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 your readings of these literary texts being very much sociologically based, um, and uh, and there's, a, there's 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 the porosity that it is between different media that, that, that Claire and Ed were talking about. But I fear I fear with the drilling <laughs> that there's another kind of porosity at stake. So um, I think at this point I'd like to thank our speakers uh, once again, and and um, let us all enjoy some lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you.